believe that's working. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, if I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you yet, uh, I'm Rabbi Dan Geffen, and welcome to uh, Temple Adas Israel. And uh, thank you for being here on this uh, beautiful yet very cold uh, Sunday afternoon. Uh, I hope that you are here for uh, one of the more exciting things we've been looking forward to for some time. And any of you who happen to know Dr. Stephen Rosen know that one of his great passions uh, is microphones and turning them on. <laughs> Uh, is, uh, is physics, and in particular, one of his, uh, his teacher's teachers, uh, the great Dr. Albert Einstein. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Dr. Rosen here uh, learned from Danish Hoffman, who was one of Albert Einstein's, uh, Einstein's colleagues. Uh, and so he's going to share a number of things with us today, and uh, he's going to speak for about 30 minutes or so, because he's very interested in having an opportunity for you to ask him questions. Uh, and again, this is in celebration of the 100th anniversary of the theory of relativity. And uh, I won't take much more away from, from Dr. Rosen, because I know that he has a lot to, uh, to tell us. He's very excited, already waiting in the wings. But I should say, at the very least, that the most important thing uh, of all, of everything that he has done in life, is that he is married to the lovely Celia Paul. So I thank you, Celia. I think all of us that know, the two of you know, if you ever sent them an email, and you know that the only two people that share an email address, that's how much of a partnership they have, um, that uh, the two of them could not exist without the other. And I think there's something in physics to be said about that as well. And uh, Steve uh, said that in uh, this particular crowd, you may remember the great Johnny Carson, so I told him I would give him a proper introduction and say, here's Stephen. <laughs> Celia is the light of my life, and uh, she is responsible for a lot of, of the food. <clears throat> She's also responsible for keeping me honest and simple and direct. Uh, she's brilliant and beautiful. And would you stand up a moment, please? <laughs> <laughs> so, sometimes science and religion live well together, and sometimes they collide. A few years ago, I was asked to be a ball bear at the funeral of my best friend's father, who was very elderly and lived a long, happy life. He was an Orthodox Jew. One of the other pallbearers <clears throat> was an Orthodox rabbi with a beard and pedas and tzitzis and a yarmulke. <clears throat> and he said to me, what do you do? And I said, I'm a physicist. And he said, are you Jewish? <laughs> I said, yes. And he says, Albert Einstein was Jewish. I said, yes. And I said, so was Richard Feynman, and so was Edward Teller, and so was Johnny von Neumann, one of the smartest guys who ever lived. But Rabbi, <clears throat> John von Neumann, who was born Jewish, converted to Catholicism on his deathbed. <laughs> oh my God. So the rabbi, this is, a true, this is a true story, this is not a joke. The rabbi stroked his beard, and he thought for a minute, <clears throat> And he said, Oi, Gavalt, is he in for a big surprise? <laughs> you can't make that up. <laughs> so here's what I'm going to talk about. Was how, how is it possible that Hitler was right to think of, of relativity as Jewish science? Yeah. And he meant it in a pejorative way, by the way, because he said we were vermin. Uh, what is overlaps about Talmudic and, and relativity thinking? Why do so many Jews win Nobel Prizes? And what is Einstein's legacy? And I'm going to try to do this in 30 minutes, I give you all a chance to ask a lot of questions and, and share your comments and your opinions about this. You do not have to understand special or general relativity 
in order to understand what I'm going to say now. But at the end of my talk, I will talk about special and general relativity, I promise, in ways that <clears throat> you will be able to explain to your grandchildren. <laughs> and we're going to sing a song about it that I wrote. <laughs> so, when I was a kid, all I could, I, could I, I looked at every book I could understand on relativity, and I just devoured them. And uh, my wife, my children, my grandchildren know that I was fascinated, mesmerized by Einstein as a person and by relativity, the ideas of relativity. So much so that we named our puppy Albie. <laughs> Albie, this is Albie, and I got Albie on the front page of the Wall Street Journal, believe it or not. That, the picture, that, that I added later, but this is on the front page of the Wall Street Journal on December 27th, I can't read that. Puppy re rescues downsized workers from the blues. City of Paul Associates and Co. Incorporated, a New York outplacement firm, accidentally discovered that the best way to calm and focus type A clients, those are the lawyers, <laughs> is to let them play with the firm owner's poop, Albert. She is right on the front page. Skeptical clients, quote, immediately <coughs> glom on to the puppy and, quote, talk more openly, says Stephen Rosen, who co owns, who co -owns the firm and the door. Okay, enough of that. <laughs> so here's the headline of the New York Times on November 10th, 1919. Einstein's paper on general relativity was 1915, and that's 100 years ago. Light all askew in the heavens. Men of science more or less agog over results of eclipse observation. Einstein's theory triumphed. Stars not where they seemed or were calculated to be. But nobody need worry. <laughs> I don't know why they had. This was the headline on the time. This is in big, big letters. And one of uh, Einstein's admirers, Professor Lloyd Mott, said, as the creation of a single mind, general relativity is undoubtedly the highest intellectual achievement of humanity. So now let's talk about Hitler. Hitler loathed Jews. In, in Mein Kampf, he said, we are vermin, uh, we are the spawn of the devil, and other terrible things about us. He, he loathed Albert Einstein because Einstein represented genius, Jewish, even though he was not religious man or observant. He did believe in God. He, um, he thought that uh, Einstein's fame was, was artificial, and he got some Nazi Nobel laureates who were experimentalists one by the name of Philip Leonard, and the other one by the name of Johannes Stark, both experimentalists who, he said, represented Aryan science, which he meant, with, that meant it was correct. But Jewish science, theoretical. Einstein was his enemy. He had a hard-on for Albert Einstein. So, how come 26% of Nobel laureates in physics are Jews? And I want to answer this in the following way. Uh, I have thought about what parallels there are between science and relativity on the one hand and Talmudic <laughs> thinking on the other. And this is what I have come up with, and I'm eager to hear your comments about. We were given the Talmud and the universe to use well. Sometimes we succeed. Uh, certainly Albert Einstein succeeded in describing the universe in, in a way that we have never had described. And probably wouldn't have been 
uh, discovered for many, many years. Unlike special relativity in 1905, that was right. Others were, were almost, almost on it. So, we've also given the Talmud, I guess, to learn, Dan, help me out here, uh, to, to learn to be better people, to behave ethically and morally. Talmudic thinking and relativity thinking have in common the concentration on light. This is the 15th day of Hanukkah. I mean, it's only eight days, but... Uh, and uh, when Dan uh, spoke a few weeks ago about Hanukkah, he said one of the purposes of the Hanukkah lights is to shed light <coughs> in the form of wisdom and knowledge on the world. Well, <clears throat> Einstein was obsessed with light. When he was 16 years old, he had a dream in which he was traveling alongside a beam of light at the speed of light. And he asked himself, what would he observe? Well, it turned out there was an experiment that could answer that question, 1898, Michael Morley, and it just said that the speed of light is constant no matter whether the source of the light is moving or the observer is moving. Very strange result, but an experimental result. And Einstein took that as one of his postulates, and we'll see how that unfolds in, in a moment. But getting back to Talmudic thinking and relativity, uh, Buckminster Fuller said, the greatest invention of the 20th century is that the invisible is more important than the visible. It's quite a statement. I don't, I don't know, we could have a good discussion about that. He, I think he was referring to Freud, uh, but his remark could also apply to, to Einstein. And that's, that's a kind of Talmudic remark anyway. So both Talmudic thinking and relativity thinking create a system of thought. A system of thought as a whole universe of ideas, some of them connected to each other. And if you remember from high school geometry, Euclid, he starts off with four or five postulates or axioms, assumptions, and from which he can prove a whole range, a whole universe of theorems about plane geometry. Well, Maimonides did the same thing. Thirteen articles or principles of Judaism that not everybody accepts, but that's not the point. The point is, if you start off with, with a set of axioms and postulates and build a universe of thought, a system of thought, Einstein just did just that, as we will see in a moment. <clears throat> the human mind is a pattern-making machine. We cherry-pick facts to suit our values. And that's true in science, and that's true in religion and in the Talmud. <clears throat> you can prove almost anything in the Talmud, and maybe even in, in the Quran as well. But both <clears throat> systems of thought require intense focus. There are no absolutes. Correct me, Dan, if I'm wrong, uh, but <clears throat> Uh, I don't think there is any absolute morality in, in the implications of Orthodox Judaism. I'd be interested in hearing your comments about that. In relativity, <clears throat> the only absolute is the speed of light. Otherwise, there is no preferred frame of reference system. And we'll see what that means. In a Duality. Special relativity talks about what a train station observer would see about the physics on a train that's moving past it, and what the person on the train would see about the physics of what's on the train station. That's w the way relativity, special relativity begins. And Einstein, who was a pretty funny guy, although I didn't know him, I admired his ideas, and his ideas spoke to me, although he never did, <clears throat> said to the train conductor, does Oxford stop at this station? <laughs> he was a wise guy. 
However, that's a profound remark. It's not only a joke. And it, it, it captures a, a piece of special relativity. In other words, the station is not preferred over the moving train. If you're on the train, it looks like the station is moving past you. So, of course, there are differences between Talmudic thinking and relativity, and one of the most obvious is the content. Um, relativity is about knowledge, and, and the Talmud is about action and, and behavior, the science of behavior. <laughs> and the purpose, I say, is to render the highest possible justice to the understanding of, of the universe, that's it, relativity and science, whereas the Talmud purpose, I think, is to render the highest possible justice to ethical and moral behavior. So now I'm going to talk about the importance of Einstein today. Notice the footnote, it's not necessary to understand special and general relativity to appreciate Einstein's importance today. And I'm repeating this because I, I think uh, people get a little bit scared of, of relativity. Um, so, like the Enlightenment, which came after the age of reason, or accompanied the age of reason, the post-Einstein universe is a different place in many, many, many ways. Uh, socially, culturally, anthropologically, art, music, literature was different after Einstein. I'm not saying they were, you know, James Joyce was not uh, influenced uh, that I know of, but, but uh, there was a lot of turmoil in the world, uh, in, in a world of, of cognition. Space, time is a, uh, a concept that we have trouble understanding, but it replaces space and time. That's a revolution, a big revolution. Gravitation becomes geometry. How did he do that? We'll talk about it in a minute. In 1905, Einstein did three, wrote six papers, it's called his Miracle Year. Each one of three topics that he addressed would have been worth a Nobel Prize, three Nobel Prizes. He didn't, he only got one. And it was not for relativity, because it was controversial. It was for the photoelectric effect. How many people have a camera, a digital camera? Well, you're living with Einstein because the little sensor in the back of the, of the camera uh, is based on the photoelectric effect. A photon, a particle of light, strikes this uh, surface and electrons are emitted that are uh, processed by a camera. How many people have a smartphone? If it has GPS in it, that's general relativity. Why? We'll see in a moment, but let me just say that because it's above the gravitational field of the Earth, far away from us, the gravitational field is different, it's weaker there. And the curvature of space-time, which I'm going to talk about in a minute, uh, affects the passage of time on that satellite. And the speed affects the passage of time. So there are two corrections that a GPS has to have or else they don't work. Einstein. Uh, Brownian motion is, is uh, pollen particles that are suspended in liquid and they, they move, these pollen particles move around as a result of being bombarded by molecules, an indirect proof of the existence of molecules. Hello, molecules. Gravitational lensing, I'm going to show you a diagram of it. What it means is that a galaxy between the Earth and the line of sight of an object that we're looking at that galaxy that's in between has, is so massive, 10 to the 11 stars, the size of our sun, that it bends the light from the distant object that you're looking at and acts very similar to a lens. And because of that, we can see deeper and further into the universe. And finally, I guess there are, there's no finally here, but 
we, we no longer think of ourselves as, as the center of the universe, really. Uh, there are now parallel universes, uh, new cosmologies where space curves around back on itself, where space is, is no longer flat. In fact, one of, one of Einstein's cosmologies was uh, thought that one model of the universe was that if the beam of light went out in, in any direction, it would eventually come back and circle back upon itself. My grandson has a three-dimensional printer, and this is a Mobius strip, which some of you may have seen. It has one surface, I'm going to pass it around, and if you run your finger all around it, it comes back to the same spot. Or you can see it later. So here are Einstein's postulates. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but they're like Maimonides' postulates for the purposes of this discussion. The laws of nature hold for all space-time coordinates. There's no preferred reference system. That's called the principle of invariance. You can't tell whether, if the, if the train is moving at a constant speed, whether the station is moving past you or you're moving past the station. Speed of light is constant. Michelson-Morley experiment. Bizarre result. Really bizarre. No experiment can distinguish between acceleration due to gravity versus acceleration due to acceleration. Now, what, what am I saying here? Einstein invented something called thought experiments, Gedanken experiments. And in a Gedanken experiment, if what you imagine follows the rules of physics and doesn't break any, then it's almost as valid as a real experiment. So here's the Gedanken experiment that Einstein called the happiest thought of my life. Imagine you're in an elevator cab in very far away from any planet, from any gravitational field. You're standing like this. And imagine somebody accelerates the elevator cab upwards. Well, we all know what we feel. We feel a downward pull. There is no experiment that can distinguish inside that elevator cab from acceleration due to acceleration versus acceleration due to gravity. If the elevator cab is stationary on the surface of the Earth, you, you, you're pulled down towards the center of the Earth. And if it's accelerated, but you can't tell the difference unless you open the window and look out. Now, suppose there was a little hole on the side of the elevator and a beam of light came in while it was being accelerated. The beam of light, let's say it was four feet above the floor of the elevator cab, if the elevator cab was accelerated, by the time the beam of light reached the far side, it wouldn't be four feet, it wouldn't strike four feet above, above the, the, the floor of the elevator cab. Why? Because in that short, space, that short distance, the elevator would have moved upward. But if acceleration and gravitation are the same thing, I've just shown you that gravity can make light curve. How about that? It's not my idea, but... <coughs> So here's about Maimonides' 13 axioms. I'm not going to spend much time on them. The Jewish religion does not have an official creed, but a lot of Jewish people accept these ideas. The point is that it's, it's a postulate, a, a system of thought based on axioms and postulates. So now, why did Jews win? I'm going to hand out, at the end of this talk, but not now, a summary of the talk, a takeaway. And the reason I don't hand it out now is I don't want you looking at it. I want you looking at me <laughs> and these reasons. So we like to think we're special. Um, we like to believe that we're here to repair the world, we Jews. Not that we're better than others, although there is some research that shows that on average we earn more money and we have higher IQs than 
address that. Um, but here's some reasons that will make us feel good about being Jewish. And then I'll show you why they're wrong. <laughs> the David versus Goliath system, syndrome. We're often repressed and uh, persecuted for <coughs> years in Russia, where my family came from. Um, but we fight back, right? We try to over, overcome that. Social capital. Jewish mothers want their parents to perform well, be doctors and lawyers. We see, we see a lot of doctors and lawyers in our profession who, who don't want to be doctors and lawyers. They wake up at age 45 and they discover that they're making a lot of money and they hate what they're doing there because their mother told them what to do. Religion is about knowledge. Seriously orthodox people study. I have a, a friend, a, a theoretical physicist, who studies Gomorrah four hours a day with a, with a study partner who's in Florida. He's in Muncie, a brilliant physicist, and they study so that they can disagree, which is part of what science is about. Survival. After the destruction of the Second Temple, Jews had to become literate to study. And literacy happens to be uh, bankable and economic advantage. We're always outsiders, hate victims of hate crimes and so on. So, <laughs> Jewish humor, maybe. Why do Jewish people tend to answer a question with a question? <laughs> answer, why not? So I want to go back now to Einstein and relativity and the Nobel Prizes. <coughs> Einstein begins with a thought experiment, another thought experiment, with a coil of wire and a magnet. And if you hold the magnet still and move the coil in and out, you will generate a voltage difference between the ends of the wire or the current. Suppose you hold the magnet steady and you move the um, coil. You get the same result. Einstein says that because the two cases give you the same observable result and only differ in the point of view, he sees them as different glimpses of the same reality. This is a Jewish style of thinking even though he was not religious. So, I'm going to read a little more here. Students approach the Talmud with a study partner, a friend, or a chavruta. Their discussion drives them through the issues in the text, and often the text is very hard to understand, like relativity, as they debate and react to one another. This interchange of ideas, thoughts, and philosophies creates a learning environment that trains the participants to see every issue from many sides. Oh, oh, this is science. To create multiple insights and that the truth is bigger than any single interpretation. Okay, now, you probably noticed this weird thing that says, Einstein's birthday. <laughs> I think I'll read what Einstein said about this. Somebody gave, I, I just made a copy, this, this is my version. Let me read to you what I'm saying. If you can see the diagram here, that's what it is. A, there's a little weight, there's a light spring inside, and a tube. I'm going to read to you what Einstein said. So he had a visitor, a very famous uh, historian of science, who, who, who uh, was having tea with Einstein said, excuse me, I want to I show you something. So he says, somebody gave this to me, and Einstein said, this is, this is Einstein being quoted, this is designed as a model to illustrate the principle of equivalence, acceleration and gravity are equal. So he lifts it, and he lets it fall. Whoops. Let me, let me do that again. What happened? You have a Y. 
the Erlen's principle. Zero gravity in free fall. This is, so let me read to you what Einstein said. Let me do it again. Oops. It worked at home. <laughs> Sorry. Stop. Stop. Oh, right. So now, Einstein, a big grin spread across his face, and his eyes twinkle like Santa Claus. <laughs> and with the light, as he said, and now the equivalence principle. So he thrust it upwards, he says, now I will let it drop, and according to the equivalence principle, there will be no gravitational force. So the spring will now be strong enough to bring the little ball into the plastic tube. With that, he suddenly let the gadget fall freely and vertically, guiding it with his hand. The plastic sphere at the top was now at eye level, and sure enough, it was in the tube. With the demonstration of this birthday present, our meeting was at an end. That's an exact quote from an interview with Einstein, a scientific in 1955. That must have been before he died, obviously. Yes. You guys, you can play with this if you like. So let me show you a few things he got wrong. And I can also show you some, some nice images of what I referred to earlier. himself, when he was stumped, uh, was famously like heard it. to say, I'm no Einstein. <laughs> something came on. No, sir. something came on. So this oh, was most likely. Yeah. Okay, okay, there we go. Thank you. Yeah. Thank so you. You'll leave me in a second. Okay. Okay. So, um, I'm going to show you a couple of things he got wrong, but better still, uh, I'm going to show you the equations Whoops. of general relativity. Okay, there he is. And this is the problem. There's some nice image of uh, artist rendition of Einstein's ideas. And there he is. Okay, here's the equation that changed the world. Probably, I think uh, Dennis Overby said it was the master equation of the universe. Uh, don't expect to understand it except for the fact that the right-hand side of the equation is all about energy, momentum, and mass, which we now know curves space. We'll talk about how that happened. And the left-hand side is geometry, about the space curvature. This is called tensor calculus. That's really 10 equations, and even Einstein got stuck on this. And I told the story in the article in the East Hampton story, my favorite story about Einstein was Danish used to work at the Institute for Advanced Study alongside Einstein at his desk. And Einstein, they would get stuck. This is really complicated. Not, no kidding. Uh, these are 10 interlinked <coughs> differential <coughs> equations that are unbelievably complicated. And we have to make approximations. So on this one occasion, Danish said we were stuck. And Einstein got up and paced the floor and twisted his hair. We have very long hair. And he said, I feel a little thick. This is Danish, quote, who had British accent, quoting Einstein in German accent. And after a few minutes, Danish said, Einstein uh, would say, oh, I know what we have to do. Let's make an approximation. And he would sit down, and sure enough, it worked out. And he said after Einstein died in 1955, when he was working alone on the equations of general relativity, he would get up, he would pace the floor, <laughs> he would twist his hair, 
he said, but it never worked. <laughs> <laughs> so this little term in here, Einstein is, what Einstein called his greatest blunder. This is called the cosmological constant. And in 1915, Einstein thought that if there's a gravitational attraction, like with electric charge, plus and minus, plus and plus, there should be a gravitational repulsion. So that's this term here, called the, gravi the, the cosmological constant. He said, this was my biggest blunder. But when a genius makes a blunder, it's a genius blunder, because it turns out that we need this now. Why do we need it? The Hubble telescope shows us that the universe is expanding not at a constant rate, but at an accelerating rate. So it's dark energy, or whatever that is, is pushing these galaxies apart faster and faster. Wow. I should make mistakes like that. <laughs> so let me show you a few more illustrations. And this is what the satellite uh, was referring to earlier. Uh, and you could see the artist's representation of the curvature of space because of the Earth, the Earth's presence here. And this is uh, uh, trying to visualize space curvature, and I have another demonstration of that in a moment. Uh, here's a satellite, and it is disturbed. Its, its timing apparatus is disturbed by the speed it's going at, from special relativity has to be corrected, and the gravitational field. Now, get a load of this. Here's the Earth. Here's a galaxy we want to study. And here's a galaxy in between. And that acts as a lens and causes the light to curve. We couldn't see this guy behind here if we didn't have this lens. And I'll show you another view of this gravitational lens. There, there's another view, same idea. Okay, so this is allowing us to see further into the universe than we had ever been before. Uh, these are, uh, uh, I don't know what they are. Um, so, uh, one of Einstein, Einstein's mistakes was that he didn't think it was possible that there were gravitational waves. And it, searching for gravitational waves is the, 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 the most, at, at the forefront of modern astrophysics today. Um, the, the force between two planets, what is there in between? How is that force mediated? When you have electric charges attracted or repelled, there are photons moving back and forth at the speed of light that carry the force. <coughs> well, there should be a force of gravity that's carried by particles, and they're, they're called gravitons. They have not been seen yet. Very difficult to experiment. So, let me go back to the planet. Wait, here we go. Okay, I got it. So Einstein was a fun-loving guy. Here he is on a bicycle, and today, what happened? Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Today, today he would, he would have been called a bohemian. Uh, long hair, uh, anti-establishment, he famously said, to punish me for challenging authority, the face made me an authority. <laughs> so now I'm going to tell you that he was a ladies' man. He uh, was a philanderer, uh, my kind of guy, except I don't do that. Uh, and here is my favorite cartoon from the New Yorker. It shows Albert in bed with a beautiful young woman who's frowning, she's smoking a cigarette, and you can tell that they just finished making love. And the caption is Einstein speaking, and he says, to you, it was fast. <laughs> <laughs> now, I have written a song which you can sing to your grandchildren, which we can sing together, and Keelan, our wonderful pianist, actually did a, a Duke Ellington arrangement of this for me. And if you'll, bear, and if you'll bear with me a moment, I will try to get it to play. 
Uh, but we can actually sing, we all know that twinkle, twinkle, little star, how I wonder how you are, or something like that. So, Albert Einstein, you want to sing along with the bouncing ball? Albert Einstein, what a guy, had more thoughts than you or I. Special relativity, yeah, yeah, MC squared is E. Gravitation holds us down, it bends light around the town. It makes GPSs right, squeezes space time all oh, so tight. Thank you. Now, this is the famous Herb Lock cartoon. It says, Joe's some planets, and it says Albert Einstein right there. My favorite thought about him. I, I feel so happy that I lived in the same century that he lived and that I could at least partially appreciate some of the beauty. He said, if, if, if my theory is wrong, I feel sorry for the good Lord. <laughs> <laughs> Not an arrogant remark because his theory is so elegant and so simple in, in its idea, basic idea, that no one else thought of it before. And Einstein was an admirer of beauty, both feminine and intellectual. Right. So I'm gonna stop now, and please, I'm interested in your comments and your questions, and I'll do my best to answer them. And I'll try to explain special general, general uh, further. Go ahead. I know very little about physics, but I've read that he missed it on quantum physics. Well, is the question is, is about quantum mechanics, which is um, <coughs> a can of worms. Uh, very, um, some people went crazy trying to understand quantum mechanics, but it works, and it's fairly, um, uh, well, one of, the, one of the founders of quantum mechanics, Lewis Bohr, said there are two kinds of truths, simple truths, the opposite of which is a falsehood, and complex, and profound truths, the opposite of which is another truth. Yeah. That describes quantum mechanics yeah. Yeah. Without, without the pain. And he, he did not believe in the statistical interpretation of quantum mechanics. He says, I cannot believe God plays dice with the universe. Right. But Niels Bohr did. And it's, it's a successful theory. Right. Niels Bohr said, who are we to tell God what to do? Say it again? Who are we to tell God what to do? <laughs> Oh, the, oh, that's a good one. Yes, Seth. Um, social scientists, particularly a guy named David Harvey. Oh, you can yeah. yes, Social scientists include, especially a guy named David Harvey. And, wait, and, wait, wait. Uh, that's where's, uh, where's Rabbi Dan? Rabbi Dan is, is had to go. No, he's somewhere. somewhere. Oh. Oh. Here. Okay. 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 Social scientists. Uh, especially David Harvey, who's a geographer, um, talk about, write about space-time compression um, in the modern era. And he's usually referring to, or at least I understand him as referring to, and that the speed with which we move around the globe uh, by communication, airplanes, is in fact shrinking the human experience of You're talking place. about emotionally, not, not well, that's, physically, right? Well, I, I'm, I'm interested in a phys, I'm just interested in what you think as a physicist, that we usually don't talk across disciplines. I know what it means in my thinking, but what does that mean? Could Einstein's theories be applied to the fact that with globalization, things move around the globe faster you know, and faster? A lot of people have tried to make uh, uh, metaphoric statements about Einstein. You know, they say everything's relative and stuff that's like that. That's a natural statement. Yeah, that's, it doesn't mean much. And um, people uh, think uh, that you can extend Einstein's theories uh, socially, as, as you've mentioned, um, I'm not so sure about that. I think um, it, it sounds good. It sounds like the person who's uttering those those 
metaphors for entering that area of uh, simile and analogy is um, trying to um, capture uh, aggrandize, take Einstein's theories and extend them beyond. And I don't think that that's really kosher, in my opinion. But there are people, yeah. Joe. I think I'll be uh, I, I surmise why you may have avoided it, but let me point out that you never got to what you said you were going to tell us about. Special relativity? No, 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 no. no. The, the reasons why, supposedly the reasons why there are so many Jewish Nobel oh. Well, I mean, uh, Let me preface that by saying I know fully well the Mishikas you can get into in answering that question. Sure. Well, I did allude to genetics and the IQ and stuff like that, and I didn't want to go there, uh, which I just did. Um, <laughs> but, yes. Steve? I have the answer to that. Okay, let's hear it. It's an old joke. Well, it's an old joke? Is it a good one? It we is. have a Jewish humor group here. I hope you can <laughs> join us. There, there are so many Jewish physicists because they didn't become MDs, and my mother would have been angry if they didn't win a Nobel Prize. <laughs> you didn't know that? <laughs> so I have another demonstration, but I also have a synopsis of, of our talk. I know you guys are leaving, so thanks. I don't have enough to Take this with you. And you want to pass these out? So now you can look at them. And some more questions or comments. Thank you for coming. Bye bye. Steve. Thanks for coming. Yeah, we have plenty. Yeah,
the relationship between uh, our religious understandings and the scientific world. Uh, and at least for me personally, I want to speak as you know myself. Um, I happen to see that there is much more uh, in common, especially as we learn more and more about the universe, with our understanding of a concept of creation than there is that uh, that um, is in conflict. But I don't think that I would feel comfortable just because of my lack of knowledge on the scientific end of things to say that they are one-to-one -one analogous. Um, however, the idea of an expanding uh, creation uh, and things starting from a particular point and moving outward, to me, that, that speaks in a very similar language to what's described in Rishi. So I gave you a very rabbinic answer, I know, which is very unfulfilling, but, uh, but that's, that's the best as I can do. Um, Steve, you just want to make sure that you're not touching the mic. Sure, yeah. Yeah. I want to say my <laughs> both comments. What does the space space time continuum? No, I don't need that. What is the space time continuum? What how given the space time time continuum theory, what do you say about the longevity of our ancestors in book? You mean in biblical yes. terms? Their their ages and the period of ah. time, etc. Does space time continuum? Answer that question of numerology. I don't think I would, I would, I mean, I, is, is the question posed to Steve or to me? I, Both of you. Okay. Uh, well, Steve, do you want to go first? Um, <laughs> well, I don't think the world was created in seven days. No, 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 I think the, the conception of, of what a day is, yeah. right, or uh, I would say functions of time, um, or years, or all those things, right, just as, as human beings in our lifetime, our understanding of time and its relative sense of things has changed dramatically that whatever we associate with years or days um, in, uh, in the biblical sense of things is, uh, is our human limited understanding of trying to, to <coughs> grasp what it is the Torah is ultimately describing to us. But what, again, the, the definition certainly in Breshit, right, it's describing the perspective from God, right? So what may have been a, a yom, as it were, and a lila to God is not necessarily the way that we conceive of time. And unless I'm mistaken, Steve, Time is relative, right? In our concept. Uh, so I guess suppose it depends on what, where your, your beginning point is. In, so I turn in, it over. in the Kabbalah, it talks about the creation uh, as what, a divine inspiration, sparks, and so on. Yeah. So a nice uh, condensed way of saying it. Uh, <laughs> Kabbalah is not my area of expertise, but what I, I will tell you is there was, you know, the, the tradition is that you're not supposed to learn Kabbalah until I believe you're in your 40s, and there's a particular reason for that. Uh, I think, uh, yeah. again, coming back to time and uh, the yeah. accumulated wisdom of time. You end up like Madonna if you study. <laughs> <laughs> so I was told by Rabbi Ephraim Buckle, I don't know, you know uh, one of my mentors in Judaism, that you're not supposed to study Kabbalah until you're over 40 and you have mastered the Talmud. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't think Madonna has to be confident. Anyway, I have one last little demo here, and I want to hear. Oh, we have a lot, lot of refreshments. Oh, first of all, uh, I want I want you to acknowledge my beautiful, brilliant wife. Wait a minute, wait again, because she made most of the food. She helped me. She helped me, and a lot of friends. Could, and she helped me with this tour. And she made me understand my talk. <laughs> so, and I wake up every morning next to the nicest person I have ever met. Oh, that's so here's a demonstration of curvature of space, space time. Only it's only a metaphor. It's only a, a, a simile. It's only an analog. I'm going to push my finger on this membrane. It's just like putting your finger on your cheek. Guess what? You make a dimple, right? Well, this is a dimple in two dimensions that are going into three dimensions. But gravitation makes a dimple in four-dimensional space-time. So you can sort of have a, a, a faint glimmering of this. And I can show you. And I, 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 I'll do it afterwards, next to the food. <laughs> if I put my finger here, that's like a dimple in space-time. <clears throat> and if I take this box of BBs, which I have with me, because I have an air rifle that my grandson loves to shoot at hubcaps with, 
And if I hold that down here and I let the BBs roll along the surface, you'll see that they wrote that they don't go in straight lines like light would do in a flat space. And if you want me, I'll do it, but they're going to fall all over the floor. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I'm sorry. So that's another show and tell. Yes. Wait, wait, wait a second. Yeah. Yeah, what you just said about dimples and gravity, you started with in your introduction of your talk when you mentioned Buckminster Fuller. Because Buckminster Fuller, with his geodesic dome, which has, has a global implication, it also deals with gravity. Because he figured out a way of holding up a structure following the forces of gravity, likely the materials distributed in another way. So it's a little bit like what you just said. I think that's right. I know you're an architect. <laughs> Did you ever meet Buckminster Fuller? I met his colleague, Comrade Blacksmith, who, uh -huh. who designed the first prefabricated house in a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. So a geodesic dome, they, they, they've um, um, stolen the word from relativity. A geodesic is the shortest distance between two lines in four-dimensional space-time. And the shortest distance uh, in four-dimensional space-time around the gravitational object is a curved line. So that, but Buckminster Fuller was a genius, and I did meet him, I sat next to him at a dinner party, and he was a pretty nice guy, and he had a very unusual life. Yes? I also met him, but he also talked about light. One of the things when you read about it is not only that he was using gravitation, he felt, whether it's true or not, that his, his architectural structure, the geodesic dome, was the bet, would produce the most light possible within an interior structure. Well, that's interesting. They also use them for radar domes today. I think he patented they made a lot of money by selling it to the government. Uh, you have yes. Uh, play devil's advocate for a minute. One of the charges against Einstein today is that quantum physics is accepted. Right. And he never liked it. That's right. And if one of the conclusions of quantum physics that basic reality is random, chance. Mm. Einstein wouldn't accept it. And one of the, he, had, he couldn't refute it, but he wouldn't accept it. And people say it was his religious prejudice that he, as he said, God doesn't play dice with the universe. Right. Yeah, now, but, but what, what you said was about quantum mechanics, and yes, Einstein was, was uh, unhappy with it, and, he, and Niels Bohr argued constantly over it. Of mine. I would love to have been flying on the wall for those conversations. Uh, but quantum mechanics applies only to the universe of the very small. It, and if you start to make metaphors about uh, wave particle duality and uh, uh, philosophy and art and, and so on, uh, I think those, those analogies and similes and metaphors uh, sound nice, but but I, I'd like to stay away from them. Uh, he didn't. He 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 understood that quantum mechanics worked, but he didn't like it. Yeah. yeah. Right. Let's, adjourn. That's it? Let's adjourn. Let's adjourn to the next room. And thanks, thanks very much for coming.